All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what's going on? Welcome to the Monday Night Live stream. Let's get the chat up here. Hold on. All right. Oh, that ain't supposed to look like that. Uh uh. Hold on. Well, I guess that's got a refresh. You know, a little, little bugginess going on here. Waiting for that to load. All right. Well, I guess let's try to close it and reopen it. How's everybody doing tonight, by the way? How's everybody's Monday go so far? John Green, what's going on? Welcome to the chat. Good to see you in here. Dark Empress, what's going on? All right, folks. How y'all feeling tonight? How did we eat today? Did y'all get y'all workout in? You get your steps in today? How'd it go in general today? By the way, folks, if you haven't liked the stream, definitely hit the like button to like the stream. Let's get it popping. Tonight's going to be an important conversation. It's going to be an important conversation tonight. Um, you know, I want to clear up a, a very important thing I get asked a lot about, which is protein on a raw vegan diet, a raw fruitarian vegan diet. Um, and there is a mathematical fact when it comes to protein intake that people leave out a lot. Uh, and I want to touch on that tonight also to give y'all a better understanding. Because when you hear this, you're going to be like, oh, shoot, I didn't think about that. Because a lot of people don't. And you know, whenever I come on, I'm going to talk about something important. Right? We're going to be we're going to be dropping tangibles tonight. Let me get jacked in here. I'm really plant based and had been. He said, I'm really plant-based and had a burrito for lunch. <laughs> Not the healthiest, but wasn't meat. Hey, you know, we've got to have a burrito every once in a while. I love burritos. Let me tell you something. Black bean burrito. With avocado. Guac. And let me tell you something. I know something about some black bean burritos. What's that? Oh, newly plant-based. Gotcha. Margie, what's going on? Good to see you in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, t I took care of you on the back end. So as soon as you get me the message, the those measurements, and we'll be able to update the plan. So you asked about PCOS. I could talk a little bit about PCOS. That's actually kind of related to the conversation tonight, believe it or not. <clears throat> Peace and blessings, Dester. What's going on? All right. So folks are still coming in. Definitely sound off as you come in. You know what I mean? Folks sound off when you when you as you come in. Uh, but I don't I don't want to um I don't want to take up too much time waiting for folks to, to to come in tonight. So I'm just gonna get started, right? We gotta talk about it. Um so I get asked a lot, right? So there's this video that I did, and I didn't realize this video would really take off the way that it did. But it was basically a video that I made about building muscle on a fruitarian diet. So I want to clear some things up about a fruitarian diet, right? Number one, a fruitarian diet does not mean that you only eat things that are fruit and you swear off anything that isn't a fruit. It's not what a fruitarian diet is. A fruitarian diet basically is a diet where fruit is the main base of the of, of the diet plan, right? Meaning that the food that you eat the most, the overwhelming majority of your food is fruit. This could be like upwards of 70, 80, even 90 percent. Some people, they go full 100 percent fruit, meaning like the only thing I eat is fruit. And technically, you know, people can do that and they've gotten phenomenal results from doing that. Um, I err on the side of flexibility and the only time that I will cut back on demi uh, or diminish flexibility is for a very specific purpose. We're trying to achieve a very specific 
uh, goal within a certain set of conditions, right? Uh, but the overwhelming majority of people, you'd be fine with, like, let's say you had four meals in a day or three meals in a day, and the first two or three meals was just, you know, all fruit, and then you had, like, a cooked meal at the end of the day, right? It would still be, like, a fruitarian diet. So an example of that would be this. Let's say your first meal is four pounds of watermelon. Your second meal was let's say four or even five pounds of bananas. And your third meal was, let's say, uh, two to three pounds of grapes. And then your fourth meal was, let's say, uh, red lentils, sweet potato, and kale, right? Um, that, at least in my opinion, is a raw vegan fruitarian diet, but it's more on the high raw side, meaning a uh, high raw vegan, meaning mostly raw, but you got one cooked meal. You don't even necessarily need to have a cooked meal every day. Um, you know, you can have a cooked meal two, three times a week, right? And I do that sometimes. Or, or you can have a cooked meal per day. It really depends on what your goals are. Um, you can be fully raw, where the difference with a fully raw diet is maybe you're adding more nuts and seeds to your diet, right? Maybe, maybe you're doing overnight oats, right or you're making some type of raw bread that you made out of like you know sprouted lentils or something like that that works also right and so that, that would still fit into a raw vegan fruitarian diet some raw vegans don't really eat much fruit at all right and instead you know they do more of like uh pulverized and sprouted and soaked grains that they will make like you know dehydrated breads and different things like that they have a little bit of fruit, but a lot of it is, you know, like leafy greens, things of this nature. Um, the thing to me, honestly, that makes the most sense is having a raw vegan diet um, that is mostly made out of fruit. I don't really know why a person on a raw vegan diet would avoid eating fruit, right? Um, but I digress. Now, when I mentioned, like, let's say four pounds of watermelon, four pounds of watermelon actually contains roughly 11 grams of protein, right? Um, you know, five or six pounds of banana actually has about like eight or nine grams of protein. Okay. Depending on the size of the bananas, that type of thing, how ripe they are. Um, it's like around eight or nine grams of protein. Okay. That may not seem like a whole lot if you're used to eating 30 grams per meal but I'm gonna to get to that. Red grapes, let's say you eat two pounds of red grapes, that right there is around seven to eight grams of protein. All right, then of course, uh, a quarter cup of red lentils measured dry is roughly 12 grams of protein. If you do, let's say a half cup of red lentils and you, know, you decide to cook them, right, you boil them, Right, so that's going to be roughly 24 grams. Right? So you accumulate protein over time. Or you can do a full cup and get 48 grams. Right? Uh, but, you know, a half a cup, it's good enough. You get your 24 from that. You can add in pumpkin seed kernels. Let's say you add in a quarter cup of pumpkin seed kernels. That's another 6 grams right there on top of the 24. Right? Um, you can add your leafy greens. Let's say you add four cups of leafy greens. That's another four or five grams or so there. So the, the protein in your diet really starts to add up, right? Now, protein intake is supposed to be calculated according to what your lean muscle mass is, all right? Now, here's the interesting thing. So your body is muscle mass and bone mass that those are the those are the two main components of what your lean body mass is and then everything else essentially is body fat right now you may say well what about water weight well water most of your water weight is actually found in your lean tissue not really your fat mass right you don't really store much fat inside your you don't really store much water inside your fat right um now it's mostly going to be stored in your organs, right? Like for lungs, for example, right? You know, your lungs are actually mostly water, 
right? Your brain as well. I'm talking like three quarters. Muscle mass is 76% water. So only a quarter of your muscle mass is made out of protein. That's the that's the caveat that people miss that people miss out on, right? So people say, well, you know, you need to calculate your protein according to what your body weight is. Nah, not really, right? Because the goal when you eat protein, the protein breaks down into the amino acids, right, in your liver, and then that enters your bloodstream, and those amino acids are gonna go to your cells. But the thing is, like, let's say you got, um, you know, the, the amino acids that are used to build muscle mass, for example, your branch chain amino acids like isoleucine, leucine, and valine, those are going to go to your muscle cells. And then inside your muscle cells, those will then get converted and turned into proteins over time, right? Now, the process that this happens at is actually very small, right? You know, your, your body will you know, build a couple grams, a few grams of protein per day, right? Uh, a very minuscule amount, right? And just to put things into perspective, um, the average male has the ability to build two pounds of muscle a month, specifically like in your first year. On average, it's around like maybe a pound, pound and a half, right? Because things happen in life or whatever the case is, you get an injury, whatever, right? And so, you can get you can have things negatively impact that and then of course your genetics where you may not be genetically geared to put on all kind of muscle mass depending on your the length of your muscles and all of this kind of stuff right but let's say a reasonable goal for putting on muscle is let's say for a man it's about 10 12 pounds in a year i think that's a good goal for women it'd be like half that for women it could be like five six pounds of muscle a year right maybe seven if she's like really hardcore about it so out of the 10 or 12 pounds of muscle that you put on 76 percent of that is water right so if 76 percent of muscle mass is like water well it's water and what it's actually water and glycogen so it's like carbohydrates and the carbohydrates break down into glucose and the glucose gets shuttled into the muscle tissue along with water, right? And the interesting thing is that the amount of water stored inside your muscle is, is, is tethered to the amount of glycogen stored inside the muscle tissue, right? So just by increasing your dietary carbohydrates you can actually make your muscles larger just by eating more carbohydrates now carbohydrate keyword hydrate right so for every one gram of carbohydrates right uh attached to that is going to be three molecules or what for every one molecule of, of of glucose per se uh is three molecules of water attached to that right so the water balance inside your muscle tissue is actually made up, right, in, in large part in conjunction with glucose it's stored inside the muscle tissue is glycogen. Going back to fruit, here's the interesting thing about fruit. Now, fruit, like muscle, is mostly made out of water and carbohydrates, right? Water and sugar, if you want to talk about, like, the macros, per se. So you'll have people who will do this weird thing where they'll demonize fruit. Oh, it's too much sugar to make you fat and all this kind of stuff. And, and when I hear that, that implies to me that they really don't actually know the function of glucose in the human body. They don't understand that this demonizing of sugar is bizarre being the fact that in order for your cells to retain water, well, the most optimal way to do that is actually by increasing carbohydrates. I mean, you breathe better and everything like that. In order to have oxygen, in order to use oxygen to power your body, you need water. And the best vehicle for that water is going to be your carbohydrates, right? Converted into glucose and storage, glycogen, etc. But in any case, um, 
with fruit, fruit are not very high in protein. They're actually very high in carbohydrates and water, just like muscle, very, very high in carbohydrates and water, or glucose and water, you could say. So the reason why people can build very impressive physiques, they're able to maintain low body fat, and they're able to put on a decent size of muscle on a raw vegan fruitarian diet is because, well, you're eating the foods that are made up of what your muscle is mostly made out of, right? A high protein diet, let's understand it. You can eat a lot of protein if you want, but most of it is just gonna get converted into uh, glucose anyway, right? Whatever amino acids that are not taken up into your cells and used in order to make new proteins is just going to get converted into glucose in the liver through gluconeogenesis. Right? It can't be used otherwise. And your body doesn't really store protein for later. Right? Your body actually uses protein in, in like an eight hour window. Right? It's like these eight hour windows, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, right? And it just does this. Um, so whatever meal you eat now, your body's going to be working on metabolizing that over an eight hour period, right? For some people, it's even longer. It depends on gastric release and all, or gastric emptying and all of this kind of stuff, right? With fruit, gastric emptying is going to be uh, accelerated, so to speak, which is the reason why people go on a raw vegan diet or like a fruit based diet. And they get hungry really quickly. It's because the food doesn't sit on your gut for a long period of time. Your body uses it really quickly, right? Um, and that's because it's easy to metabolize, it's easy to use for energy, and it's easy to, to store inside your lean mass. Right? Um, so, on a fruit-based diet, let's say you were eating 100% fruit. The only thing you ate was fruit. You could actually get at least 30 grams of protein in just 2,000 calories, right? So now check this out. What I want to do is I want to pull something up right quick. And I want to show y'all the this, this, this specific math here. And I wrote a little something down beforehand. I might put this in a short or something like that just to give the shorthand version. All right, so let's say you had 145 pounds of lean body mass on you. In order to figure out how much protein you wanted to consume or you needed to consume in order to maintain that 145 pounds, you would divide that 145 by 2.2. The reason for that is because one pound or, or one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So if you're measuring the factor in how many grams to consume, you would basically do kilograms to grams. So one gram of protein per kilogram of lean mass, right? So if you divide that 145 by 2.2, this gives you 66 kilograms of lean mass, right? Lean mass meaning not fat mass. Now again, muscle mass is 76% water. So if you subtract that 76% from the 66, you actually get 16 kilograms, right? So your whole four, your whole 145 pounds of lean muscle mass can be sustained by 16 grams of protein. Now, if you eat 2,000 calories of fruit, right, and get that 30 grams of protein, you're eating nearly double that. Practically is double that. Right. Does everybody follow me so far? Let me check in with y'all in the comments right quick. You so you got to be better prepared next time. Can't sleep on the meal plan. What do you mean can't sleep on the meal plan? Literally can't sleep or just a figure of speech? <laughs> so now ha building building muscle on a fruit based diet. So we're talking about like this 16 this. Oh, OK, got you. So 16. 
16 grams of protein to sustain that whole 145 pounds of lean mass. Now, what if you were trying to gain new lean mass? Well, a good comfortable cushion is just to double that, which would get you to the 30. Now, here's the thing. Um, if you're eating enough fruit and it's just fruit and you're eating enough and it, this, the specific foods you choose does matter because some fruits have more have more uh, protein than others. And if you're going to eat like a raw vegan diet, it's a very good idea to have avocado on a daily basis, right? To get those fats in. Um, avocado and coconut yogurt are some of the best quality uh, fats. When I say quality fats, what I mean is they're the most easily digested in the least toxic forms, right? You don't have to cook them so they don't go through any kind of oxidative damage before you before you eat them, all that kind of stuff. Um, even something like roasted nuts, which, you know, I eat, I don't have a problem with eating, but, you know, uh, there is a certain level of oxidative damage that happens to the fats and nuts, right? Dry roasting is the best option, but it's still cooked, so there is going to be a bit of oxidative damage there to the fats um, in that food. So if you wanted to avoid that, well, then foods like um, coconut yogurt and avocado are going to be some of your best options there, all right? Um, or just coconut, period, right? Um, so typically, when I write a diet plan for somebody, let's say it's a woman for women on average, when I write like a raw diet plan, it typically comes out to be in around 40 to 60 grams of protein per day when I write it, but I don't just have, I usually don't make people diet plans where it's just fruit and nothing else. I don't really write plans like that unless it's, unless there's a good reason to be really restrictive, right? But I like to give people a little flexibility. So let's say you get like 30 grams or even 25 grams of protein from the fruit. And then you add a cooked meal and that one cooked meal has like around, you know, 40 or 30 grams of protein right there, right? You're pretty much good on your protein intake. If you wanted to over, if you wanted to simplify it very broadly and generally, one gram of protein is enough, not only to sustain your current lean mass, but to build your most optimal lean mass in a year. It really honestly is enough. But the biggest deciding factor on how much muscle you build is going to be how hydrated you are how much carbs you consume and how you're training and of course how you're sleeping those are going to be the biggest factors it's not going to be protein intake to create a big a bit of perspective here one interesting thing to note is that our population is getting sicker and fatter and more depressed generation after generation along with that each generation eats more protein than the previous one. So protein consumption and obesity, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, depression, anxiety, all of this stuff, it goes parallel with each other. I'm not even necessarily saying that more protein is necessarily going to cause you to be obese. That's not what I'm saying. Because I don't just look at protein in a vacuum, right? It's like, well, it depends on where you're getting the protein from, right? I'm not going to be getting obese if I'm getting my protein from lentils and fruits and, you know, uh, whole grains and things like that. I'm not going to be getting obese from doing that. However, your average American, per se, is getting their protein from fish, eggs, chicken, red meat, things like this, right? And even things that aren't animal products, like people will go and they'll get like a breakfast bar. And it'd be like this little cereal bar where it'll have a whole bunch of stuff crammed into it. You know, these dry breakfast bars you could grab and go. And they're advertised to you. High protein, right? Because our, our society is obsessed with protein. And people don't even realize that the amount of protein that you need, you can actually cut it by like 70. The, the amount of protein that you think you need, you can actually cut that by like 76%. You don't need anywhere near as much protein as you think. Carbohydrates, and I keep telling people, carbohydrates is the thing that dictates your training performance, your sleep quality, your libido, your hormones, everything. It's going to be carbohydrates. On a cellular level, 
the the carbohydrates break down in the glucose the glucose gets stored in, in, inside your cells as glycogen and that sets the water balance within your cells that is needed to hydrate your body right carbohydrates all right if your cells are dehydrated, that means a lack of oxygen into your cells, right? So even like in your lungs, right? You need, you, you need a certain balance of water in your lungs in order to be able to breathe, right? Literally being dehydrated will raise your blood pressure. All right. Being chronically dehydrated will destroy your kidneys being chronically dehydrated will destroy your liver being chronically dehydrated will cause muscle loss okay being chronically dehydrated will cause you to have pcos right somebody asked me about pcos earlier dehydration is like one of the main things that causes obesity like the way we have now all the, the chronic illnesses that we have a lot of it is a result of dehydration because contrary to popular belief, your average person, I guarantee you, any person, if you are overweight, if you're obese, I guarantee you, you do not have a, a, a high carb diet. I guarantee you, you don't. I, I've spent years getting on calls with people who are struggling to lose weight. And the one thing they all have in common is they have a low carb diet and they have a lot of protein and fat in their diet. And they also under eat. The reason why that matters. Okay. I give you an example. Your average American eats what? Bacon, sausage, eggs, dairy. All these things are dehydrating foods. Low carbohydrate foods are naturally uh, going to be dehydrating. This is the reason why a keto diet, people go on a keto diet and they're like, oh, I lost like seven pounds in a week or something like this. And I'm like, yeah, you're dehydrating your cells. Just losing a lot of water. Yeah, that happened. Even like bodybuilders, bodybuilders before they, you know, when they do in contest prep and they want to look all thin skinned and striated and whatnot, they look, they want to look as ripped as possible. They cut their carbohydrate intake, right? And then they start drinking more caffeine or they start taking caffeine pills to get the water out. And then of course they feel miserable, their libido crashes through the basement and they feel like garbage with low energy, right? But they do that so they can look a particular way on stage, right? But when a bodybuilder actually wants to put on size and they wanna add more volume and girth to their muscle, they, eat, they start shoveling rice into their mouth and it's all rice and quinoa and potatoes and stuff, right? In order to build the muscle mass. And talk to any pro, like competitive bodybuilder, they'll tell you this, right? And this is the thing that they've done for decades, right? All the elite level, pro level bodybuilders, this is what they do, right? Put on the muscle mass, as much muscle mass as possible, carb up, right? We're talking 60% of your macros coming from carbohydrates. And then when it's time to cut and drop that body fat, they cut their carbohydrates, they increase more calories, they try to sweat and all of that and try to get rid of some of that water and everything like this. But if you want to feel better and have more energy and have better health, one of the best things that you can do is be more water rich. And this is where fruit comes in. One key element in fruit is fruits are not just rich in water, but also rich in potassium. Right. And potassium regulates the amount of water that's in your blood. Right. And it regulates the amount of water that's in your blood and in your cells. Right. Your lean tissue cells and all this. So you got the carbohydrates that break down into glucose and it shuttles the glucose into your cells, stores it in the form of glycogen. And that incentivizes a certain amount of water to be retained inside your cells. Right. By the way, there's a supplement that you can also take that benefits, that, that adds a benefit in this regard. It's called creatine, right? Specifically creatine monohydrate. Now, your body makes its own creatine. Your body makes like a gram of creatine per day. But you can supplement with like five grams of protein a day to bring yourself up to a solid six grams of protein. And as you do this on a daily basis, your cells will be saturated with more creatine. So you'll have more water volume inside your cells. 
more water volume inside your cells increases the protein synthesis rate and ATP conversion. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, right? So glucose metabolism is where you, you're, the mitochondria of your cells basically will metabolize that glucose in order to produce this molecule called adenosine triphosphate. It's actually three, right? Um, but just ATP for short. Um, and that's your energy source, your main energy source for your lean muscle tissue. In fact, all the cells in your body actually develop this, right? They have their own mitochondria. Um, so let's say you had PCOS. One of the best things that you can do is have 60% of your macros coming from carbohydrates, at least 60, right? And have a water rich diet. So here's a few fruits that I think you should eat if you have PCOS, okay? Watermelon, cantaloupe, mango, berries, and multiple strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, goji berries, cherries, oh yeah, cranberries, grapefruit, apples, kiwis, bananas, right? And avocado right and what what happens here is not only are these foods hydrating not only do they speed up your metabolism you literally will burn more calories in a day from eating these foods because they have the they have the highest rate of carbohydrates second to protein i mean they have the highest level of thermogenic energy second to protein so out of the three macros, each one stimulates a certain level of thermogenesis in the body. Protein, then carbohydrates, then fats. All right? But if you wanted to maximize thermogenesis and body heat in your diet, carbohydrates would, would, would influence that. Right? There's a reason for that, too, is because carbohydrate-rich foods often have a certain vitamin and mineral profile. So, for example, um, folate. Folate is really important to balance your hormones, the synthesis of new cells, including uh, muscle tissue, uh, your nervous system function, brain chemistry, brain health, all this type of stuff. Folate, right? Vitamin B9. Um, this is a big deal when it comes to energy production and, and the overall environment of your body, right? And that folate is predominantly going to come from carbohydrate-rich foods in a plant-based diet, right? So like literally you can eat like a cup of white basmati rice, right? Let's say you took basmati rice and you measured it dry in a measuring cup, one cup, and you cooked that, that would cover your folate needs for the entire day. It'd be more than enough folate, right? It's like over a hundred percent of your RDI. Right? A quarter cup is like 25% roughly. Right? Uh, cantaloupe. You eat a whole cantaloupe, and that's it's almost, depending on the size of the cantaloupe, it could either be 100% of your folate needs or like 80%, somewhere around that. I think it's like 22% per serving or whatever the case is. Last time I looked up the numbers. So if you're eating all these folate-rich fruits, bananas, cantaloupes, red grapes, you're eating red lentils, things like this, you're going to be getting an abundance of that folate. And this is why when people go on a carbohydrate rich diet with all of these juicy fruits and whatnot, they start to feel better. You sleep better, you, your anxiety and depression fade, then things go away. I've had people, I have a hundred percent success rate with getting people off of their anxiety and depression medications. I have a hundred percent success rate with this. And it happens real quick. <clears throat> you put them on a diet like this, and within a couple weeks, they're like, man, I feel great. I'm not getting the panic attacks. I'm sleeping better. I'm not getting the high blood pressure, the heart palpitations. Um, I don't feel sad and depressed. I don't have the, sh the, the sugar cravings. I don't have the salt cravings. I feel much better, right? It's because that increase in folate, it's the increase in water, it's the increase in potassium. It's the increase in magnesium. It's the increase in manganese. 
So you got to look at the the micronutrients also. So you have a lot of people like uh, keto influencers, and they won't talk about these things. They don't want to talk about folate. They don't want to talk about magnesium. They don't want to talk about manganese because, well, these things are all in them carbohydrate-rich foods that they love to demonize, right? Um, they'll never tell you that muscle mass is made out of 76% water because that undercuts their whole, hey, you need more protein message, right? Protein builds the dry mass of the muscle. There's only 20, 24% of your muscle mass that is made out of protein. So why you need to eat all this protein for? Right? 145 pounds of muscle tissue is actually the true dry weight of it. It's like 16, 16 grams is enough. It's 16 kilograms. Right? Erectile dysfunction, same thing. Cut them fats back, okay? You can cut your fats down to like 15, 20% and increase your carbohydrates to six, 60, 70%. Right? If you have your macros around like that, that 60, 55%, 65% ideally on your carbohydrates, Fellas, you'll feel amazing. This is a testosterone booster. No joke. Literally increasing your carbohydrates. This is a testosterone booster. Because how do you increase blood flow? You need to get hydrated. How are you going to increase blood flow if you're dehydrated? Because guess what happens to your blood plasma if you're dehydrated? You're less blood plasma. Because what is blood plasma? It's water. You want you want to you want more red blood cells, you want more blood plasma. Guess what you gotta do? You gotta get hydrated. How do you get hydrated? You gotta increase your carbohydrate intake. You, you need more of those B vitamins. You need more of that thymine. You need more of that folate. Right? I'm not gonna name all the B vitamins, but you know. Right? You need more potassium, more magnesium, manganese, all this type of stuff. If you want to not be constipated, <laughs> right? You got bloated gut, gas, right? Constipation. Guess what you need more of? More water, more carbohydrates. Now, I'm not talking about carbohydrates from like Ritz crackers. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about carbohydrates from rice cakes. It's not what I'm talking about. Nothing processed. We want whole food carbohydrates. Whole foods. So when I say carbohydrates, the caveat isn't like, you know, we're not getting junk carbohydrates with no fiber and it's just stripped of all those nutrients or something. Right? Or kamut, right? Egyptian ancient grain kamut. Right? But other than that, we're getting our carbohydrates primarily from fruit and legumes and some whole grains like oats or basmati rice or quinoa or kamut or something like that. Oh, and then there's sweet potato, right? PCOS, uh, what else? PCOS, Hashimoto's, fibroids, uh, fibromyalgia, really any type of arthritis, endometriosis, all of those issues I just named, same strategy. Hydration, carbohydrates. You got to nourish your cells, okay? So why can't you do that with fat? Your body doesn't use fat for energy very well, right? Big problem with the whole obesity thing in the first place is the fact that you eat fat and it pretty much just gets stored right out the gate. And when it comes to muscle tissue, any more than 1% of muscle tissue, uh, tissue storage of fat, you're going to have insulin resistance problems, okay? Literally, storage of excess fat inside lean tissue causes type 2 diabetes. And the primary mechanism for that is saturated fat, because saturated fat isn't really regulated by the human gut so well. Saturated fat is, an, is, a, 
it's an endocrine disruptor slash uh, mitochondria disruptor. It's also a digestive disruptor. So a good example would be uh, magnesium absorption in the intestines, right? If you're getting a lot of saturated fat in your diet, that saturated fat is going to be in. in These are the best. Like Elvis Presley. If you're a junkie reward, because members get a free medium high iced coffee you know? every Monday this month with any purchase. Here. Not oh, a member? Turn on the app. No, Miracle runs on you. Know if you like it. Not like you imagine. You're being too goddamn aggressive in the mirror. Oh, is there something you're hiding? What is going on? I want to lie for my own. Hold on a second here. I got DC'd. So just give me a second here. What's the damage? Hold on. Are we going to be able to fix this? No, no, I just got DC'd, so I'm trying to reconnect. All right, am I back? Did we do it? Oh, no. What's going on? Oh, come on. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure how I can fix this. It just ended. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like it, but it doesn't look like it's ended on my end, so I don't know what happened. Oh, okay. I'm back now because it still looks like I'm frozen on my end. Uh, folks, put a one in the chat if you can hear me and I'm back. I can't see on my end. So the stream, the, the stream crashed. I don't know if it crashed in my OBS or YouTube. I'm not sure which one it is. Oh, I'm seeing ones here. All right. So y'all can. So we're back. We're, we're, we're in. Okay. Look at that. Everybody just went and dipped off, huh? Look at that. Y'all thought I was gone forever. Look at that. We're left with the riders here. It's all good. Things happen. You said there's a lag. Is there still a lag? Yeah, because it still looks frozen on my screen. But if y'all can hear me clearly, um, and y'all can see me clearly, I guess I'm just going to keep... I forgot where I left off at, but let me catch up with these comments. Some of y'all are still back in here. That's right, the riders. We got Margie still in here. Trap Silas, Nick, got Jam23, Cali Girl, what's going on? How you doing? Good to see you in here. Got Alexis in here, Colleen, 
a Wilders in here, Tyler. Look at that. Okay, we still got we still got the still got the riders in here. Let me let me catch up with y'all in these comments though. Let's see. Yeah, we got a massive hitch in the in in the giddy up. They say right. So I don't know what's going on with that. Video keeps coming off. Let's see about the question, the comments in here, because I gotta catch up with y'all. I know y'all got some questions for me in here. <laughs> YouTube trying to cut the lesson. <laughs> Have I tried phone yo? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Glucose turned into fat or lipids? Yeah, I mean lipids. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, thymine and foliar are the, are the bees. Yep, there we go. I thought that right white rice was high GI. Uh, not basmati rice. Basmati rice is like a 50 on the glycemic index. Um, anything 55 and below on the glycemic index is, uh, is low on the glycemic index. Uh, let's see other raw fruits other than cantaloupe for better liver health issues uh as far as liver issues pretty much it's going to be i mean it could be cantaloupe watermelon bananas all types of berries apples as apples are actually really good for your liver health grapes are really good for your liver health pears uh cucumber that's a big one that's really important for liver health um kiwis grapefruit and tangerines the citrus fruits are really good for your liver health pineapple uh papaya papaya is really good for your liver health and avocado also very good for your liver health uh let's see i can tell you i felt great within the days of sleeping better it was within the week. Oh, yep, yep. Margie will tell you. That's right. Cali Muscle said creatine will mess up your kidneys. I don't know about that. I mean, maybe his kidneys because he had all kind. He was on all kind of steroids and stuff, so he might have some pre-existing damage. Uh, let's see. What fruits should I eat for high blood pressure? Yeah, pretty much all the ones that I named here in the stream. All the ones that I put in your plan. They're good for blood pressure. How's oh, the abstract looking decoration? Yeah, that's Don Ann. She puts together the reefs. So she hand makes these like this one here. You know what I'm saying? Get a little bit of a, of a twist there. Hold on one second. Let me see how this thing look on my phone. I'm gonna pull up a secondary source here. It did me dirty tonight, let me tell you. Hold on. How do I get to my thing here? All right. Well, I don't look frozen on my end here. I just look frozen on my screen. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> All right. I don't know if he's answering questions from the chat. What answer? What what questions did I leave out? I bought vegan food today, so I was too tired to eat meal prep. All right. Where's the questions at? I may make some shorts answering some of the questions that I that, that I that I missed in the chat. Um, oh yeah, soursop is really good for your liver, if you can get it. Uh, if you don't want to do live, co live culture yogurt, you can do kimchi or sauerkraut or pickles or kombucha, right? Um, you just got to make sure that if you decide to get things like that, that you want to get it from the refrigerated aisle. Yeah, black rice is legit. The wild rice, yeah. What's interesting is wild rice is not really like a grain. It's a seed. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, so that's the deal as far as uh, protein is concerned. Um, pomegranate is it, is pomegranate good for PCOS? Yeah, I, I mean it could be. It there's not like a, a specific food that works in a vacuum for PCOS, right? Because PCOS essentially, um, PCOS basically is a stress illness, right? It's it's exclusively um, created from stress, stress from poor eating habits, press uh, stress from poor sleep quality. Usually the combination for PCOS is a uh, fatty diet, fried foods, poor sleep quality, alcohol consumption, emotional stress. Those are like the five points of PCOS. Those five things together will ball up like a fist and punch you in the ovaries. Um, that's essentially how PCOS works. Uh, some more, some more raw fruits for gallbladder. Oh, okay. <laughs> so with gallbladder, um, a, a good rule of thumb that I, that I say for people who have like a missing gallbladder or a dam damaged gallbladder is your, your fat intake should be uh, 0.5 grams of fat per kilogram of lean mass. That's a, that's a good calculation there. For a lot of people that works out to be around in between 25 and 35 grams of protein a, uh, a fat a day or 25 to 40 right um so as long as you keep your fat intake like around let's say for a for a man it's probably going to be around 35 40 grams of fat per day um and then have a mostly carbohydrate rich diet i think that will go a long way towards um your gallbladder issue Um, so then, you know, papaya, mango, and pineapple would be some really good foods for your gut health issues, right? Cantaloupe also very good. So I would say, yeah, basically the orange ones, right? Uh, pineapple, papaya, mango, uh, grapefruit, apples, apples would be a big one for you. Uh, goji berries. Uh, golden kiwis, actually, right? That's a, that's a good one right there also. Uh, what else? I said bananas. Bananas are really good for your digestive health. Um, and then your fat source, would, would, the go-to for that would be like avocado. Right, I think that would be the, pro, the, the, the big one. Um, for your dietary fats, uh, soaked chia seeds. Okay, um, so pre-soaked chia seeds that's a big one um to put into your diet and then things like coconut yogurt also or cashew yogurt or oat yogurt even right those work too nay nay what's going on the juicing question what's the juicing question oh do i juice at all i haven't juiced in a while um just because i haven't just i haven't pulled the juicer out since this summer Um, but some of the things that I like to juice in particular, cucumber, beets, grapefruit, apple, and carrots. Those are some things, not all those things together, right? But those are just some of the few things that I like to juice. I personally, I like chewing and eating my foods, right? So I'm not really too much of a smoothie person. I like eating and chewing, biting my foods, right? So, uh, that's, that's my deal there. How effective is gaining muscle mass on a fruit on a fruit fast? Um, it's actually very effective. The only thing is you have to make sure that you're eating enough, right? So uh, more than likely, you will be you will feel like you're eating all day long, <laughs> right? Um, so you you probably want to be eating like around you know 12, 16, maybe even twenty pounds of fruit a day, depending on um, what your, what your needs are, right? But it's a lot of fruit. I mean, you'll be eating like six bananas at a time, a whole cantaloupe at a time, two to three pounds of grapes at a time, four apples at a time, you know, six kiwis, eight tangerines, like it'd be a lot of fruit at a time. Um, if you really wanted to maximize like, you know, that muscle mass gain or whatever the case is. Um, Uh, 
Uh, but essentially, your carbohydrate intake is largely dependent on your lean mass. So what I would do is you would shoot for a target of five to six. I want to say you shoot to six, you shoot for six grams of carbs per kilogram of lean mass. So if you're just going to just do fruit only and you want to build muscle doing that, it's pretty much going to be around six grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of lean mass, right? So you could be getting, depending on your size, 400, 500 grams of carbs a day, maybe even 600 per day, right? Uh, let's see. Triple RPG, non-alcoholic fatty liver, by the way. What's that? For someone that has fatty liver, with the intake of sugar from fruits or carbs, hold up. Would the intake of sugar from fruits or carbs? Question mark. I would think since it's raw and from, would they what? I would assume you meant is it harmful? Is is that what you meant? Um. No, I mean. So I mean, your your body doesn't store it. It is your body. It's it, your body doesn't hoard it in the way that it does with like, you know, unregulated dietary fats or, you know, from processed foods or things or, you know, sugar. You don't really, from all the evidence that I've seen, the more fruit you have in your diet, the easier it is to reverse non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, to be quite honest. Uh, and the reason for that too is because of how water rich the food is and how quick your body uses it for energy, right? Um, and it's difficult to binge eat fruit, right? Because of how water rich it is, you'll, you reach capacity pretty quick, right? Uh, so you can't just sit up there and just eat nonstop. Like you could, like you can eat like a couple sleeves of Oreos. You can eat three or 4,000 calories of Oreos, just dunking them in milk for an hour straight and not feel full until you're like three or 4,000 calories in with fruit. You get full after like five or 600 calories worth. Right. So it's, it's very good at regulating how much you eat at one time. Right. Um, so those are the foods that respond the most where the carbs in that will mostly go to your lean mass, not to mention with fruit of all the carbs in fruit, half of it is glucose and half of it is fructose. So basically all of the carbohydrates that you eat in one meal. So like, let's say you eat a hundred grams of carbs. Um, in fruit per meal, 50 grams go to the muscle tissue, 50 grams go to the liver, right? And the thing is, is that the 50 grams of, of glucose that goes from the fruit and hits your bloodstream, it gets sucked into your lean tissue cells. And so your blood sugar then comes down pretty quickly after eating the fruit. And then that registers to signal your liver to start metabolizing stored fructose and then turn that into usable energy to dump into your bloodstream in order to send more to your lean tissue, especially your brain. Your brain uses at least 20% of all of the glucose that you consume. So your lungs, all your liver, all your organs are using glucose. Your brain is burning through tons of glucose. So you don't really store it that much like that, right? Um, so it actually helps to reverse non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's what all the current scientific data we have says also. Alexis, honeydew is really good for gallbladder and liver. True. I can feel the difference. There you go. Oh, the papaya seeds. Let me tell you something. Papaya seeds. Yeah, the papaya seeds that get that, get that digestion. It's right up there with ginger and turmeric. Yeah, especially ginger. Thank you for taking the time to answer my question. Really appreciate it. Subbed a week ago and have been binge watching your videos. I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I come on here every Monday and do these streams. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, by the way, real quick. And I got to plug. I got to be better about plugging my stuff too. Because people are like, what do I do to get more help? So here we go. Um... In the description of this video, there'll actually be a link to book a call with me. All right. I'm going to start saying that up front earlier in the stream, but essentially, yeah. So 
it, there'll be a link to book a consultation call with me. So you click that link, it'll pull up a calendar and show you all of my availability and you pick whatever day and time works for you. Um, you can also sign up for coaching as well, right? Um, but you know, the call basically, it gives you a chance to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, get some more answers to your questions. And then if you want me to make you a diet and a training plan, I actually got to talk more about training too. I think I'm gonna talk about training on the next stream. Uh, because that's a whole nother conversation that we got to have as well. And that's a good follow-up conversation to this one that we're currently having. Uh, but in any case, yeah, I do diet and training plan, right? Um, so if you want to sign up for coaching, I, I do that as well. So that would be in the link in the description in my link tree. All right. Being a fruitarian and living in the Northeast in the summer is a little easier in the fall. In winter, what fruits, apples, or grapes, or oranges? Yeah, what? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Best caller ever booked in two weeks on his plan. I'm no longer in high blood pressure meds. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. We getting free off the meds. Big shout out to you, Cali girl. You, look, let me tell you something. You... Watch by the end of the month. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, I got a lot of experience with uh, blood pressure issues and whatnot. So yeah, basically I'm a high raw vegan nutritionist, uh, strength and conditioning, performance enhancement, and corrective exercise coach. All right, so that's pretty much my background there. I specialize in using high raw vegan nutrition to reverse chronic illnesses and get people to their body recomposition goals. So, but I put a lot of time and energy into reversing metabolic disorders and um, chronic illnesses. That's a lot of what I focus on, right? So uh, the nuances of human health, right? So, you know, people come to me for, you know, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, fatty liver, autoimmune disorders, food allergies, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's my wheelhouse there. But I want to start talking more about building lean muscle mass because that's a big part of it. Your food will help you a tremendous bit when it comes to, um, you know, re reversing chronic illnesses and things like that. But I think we, we really got to, and I want to take some more time to talk about this on the next stream, but actually building muscle in your training. Um, what I will say about building muscle and training is actually training to build strength and muscle is a form of therapy, right? And your body builds muscle as a defense mechanism. It's very important to understand this too. If you, if you want to know how to build muscle, if you want to know at the root of why muscle grows, muscle grows as a defense mechanism. So I'm gonna give you an example. You move a weight, right? You work a particular muscle. The more you work that muscle and the harder you work that muscle, the more fatigued it gets. The more you work that muscle, it gets fatigued and the nervous system stops responding and the muscle fibers aren't really able to contract. As the muscle becomes more fatigued, the connective tissue becomes more vulnerable. Tendons, ligaments, muscle fibers, they're all very susceptible to tearing and damage as the muscle gets more fatigued. Your body registers this fatigue as a threat. Your body responds by, first of all, using your parasympathetic nervous system to get you to stop. So you'll feel a burning sensation. You'll feel the, the numbness to basically, well, if we get the muscle fibers to stop firing by basically numbing the nervous system, that's how your body makes you stop doing the thing you're doing. <laughs> you know, what's funny is that human beings are actually 10 times stronger than you actually are. So for example, if your max back squat is 300 pounds, you can probably actually squat like a thousand pounds. The only reason why you can't squat a thousand pounds is because your nervous system keeps you from doing it, 
right? And the reason why is because your bones can't handle the muscular contraction at its peak. So what happens is your nervous system will dial down your strength in order to protect your connective tissue and your bones, right? So your nervous system suppresses most of your strength to protect the underlying infrastructure that the muscle's connected to. But in any case, um, muscle fibers grow or your body grows muscle in order to reinforce the muscle to make it stronger so that when you go and engage in that kind of fatiguing activity again, your body has a better time withstanding it. Which means that your, your connective tissues, your tendons and your ligaments and your bones and all of that will be will be safer when there's more muscle. So in order to build muscle, you have to train a muscle to that point that signals a threat. Most people struggle to build muscle because they're not training hard enough. The biggest mistake that people make is they train too long and not hard enough. So you got to flip it. If you want to build muscle, you have to train for less time and more intense. Right? So you're better off training at a 10 for 20 minutes than you are training at a six for an hour. Right? So these are things that I'm going to talk about on the next stream, right? We're talking about training because a big part, like if you have diabetes, one of the best things that you can do is build muscle mass where you take your muscle groups and you push them hard. Literally this type of training will increase insulin resistance because your body will desperately rush glucose to your cells in order to replenish that muscle. So with type 2 diabetes, in order to reverse it, you need to get your body to be more insulin resistant. Best way to do that is to pretty much force your body to do that by hitting or working a muscle to the point where the glycogen storage is so depleted that this, the red signal, the, those inflammatory acute signals go off. Yo, let's get, let's get some glucose into these cells now fat will be metabolized in your liver dumped into your bloodstream to keep you from passing out and then start shuttling that glucose to your cells right when you eat dumb lean muscle tissue cells are gonna lean all well, muscle tissue is lean tissue but your muscle cells all those muscle fibers will be sucking up glucose like nobody's business. As a defensive mechanism to be prepared. Yo, we got to build this muscle. We got to recover this muscle. We got to do this now. Right? So when people talk about, oh, diet and exercise, it's not just any old exercise. You have to push your body hard enough to make it absorb that glucose in the right cells. Right? The last thing I'll leave on is this. Look at long distance runners and then look at sprinters. Sprinters look a million times more muscular than long distance runners. And the reason why is because when you're sprinting, literally the foundation of being a good sprinter is maximum effort. Sprinters are fast simply because they know how to produce their ultimate max effort. So when you're running as fast as humanly possible to try to break your time, that requires you to produce a maximum effort on demand. Running a marathon does not require maximum effort. It actually requires just the bare minimum of sustainability. It's a fundamentally different thing. Right? If you're trying to get more muscular, you need effort. And I mean maximum 
effort over a very, very short period of time, like nine seconds. Right? Max effort over a very short period of time. That's how you build muscle. Um, and I'm kind of reconditioning myself to do this. This is what I was doing with my resistance bands, actually. Um, I was using resistance bands and I was essentially pushing a muscle to the very, very max. You can do this really easily with resistance bands because the, the, the risk of injury is so low. Resistance bands are actually so effective for building muscle because you can push a muscle with resistance bands way harder than you can with free weights because of the risk of injury with free weights is so much higher. Right? And with a resistance band, you can choke up the band and do a rep. And then when you just no longer can get any more reps, you can just loosen up your grip a little bit more and then just keep pushing out reps. You can, and you can dig so deep into that muscle. You can give so, you can push past a maximum effort in one set and then just boom, you're done. Right. And that will, and that will encourage growth in a muscle. So I spent two years not touching a barbell or a dumbbell, just resistance bands. And so when you see my pictures online of me looking all super muscular and lean and whatnot, my videos, that, that was built with resistance bands over a period of two years. And that's something that I've never done before in my life. I've been a gym rat my whole life. And so doing that with resistance bands is a real eye opener, right? So now I'm back in the gym and I do one set per exercise and basically just maximum effort within that one set. And that's really the whole goal, right? Um, and so that's going to be my next very interesting journey that I'm doing. Um, according to the science, I know it works, which is the reason why I'm doing it in the first place. I don't really do things that I'm not sure actually works. Right. Um, what is it? I want to call now. Yeah. I, yeah. Right. I mean, we talk about Trent when we talk about um, the training. Hey, where have you studied? Um, NASM, NCSF, ACE. <laughs> I actually got various different certifications from a few national bodies. Um, but a lot of the information that I learned was from independent research. Uh, you can't really learn all the things that I personally know through one certification because it's just too many uh, things. So a lot of it is a combination of what I learned through getting certified in corrective exercise, performance enhancement, strength and conditioning, even the nutrition stuff, right? Because a lot of the stuff that I've studied in nutrition is, is not on any certification. People don't even learn this in college, right? Like you can take the course in college to be like a, you know, a, a board certified dietitian. And they don't know about the protein thing with the 76% and the, and all they don't, they don't even know. Right. I've had, um, <clears throat> I've had board certified dietitians reach out to me and they said, you know what? They told us to calculate protein according to, uh, our total body weight. The official guideline is 0.7 grams per pound of body weight. And I'm like, well, you can't give that. You, you can't give that measurement for everybody universally because what hap you can't say that a person who's 30% body fat should be consuming the same amount of protein as somebody who's 10% body fat. Those numbers don't check out. Right? Um, and they don't teach you how to be a fruitarian, right? That's not a part of the guidelines, <laughs> right? So you'll have people graduating from college board certified dietitian they say you got to avoid fruit because it's too much sugar if you're diabetic or telling people hey you know if you got high blood pressure you should you should avoid putting salt in your food right um so it's a lot of these things where culture kind of overrides the actual science uh you know which is you know it's kind of and this actually doesn't just happen in new, when you study nutrition in college but it also happens in pretty much every field of study. 
right? And so this is why you need like PhDs and things like that, where you have to have people who go off on their own and do independent research and write a thesis and then present it because it's not in the standard curriculum, right? So you have, you have like these PhDs to go and step out of the standard um, uh, stuff that you learn and your master's degree and all this type of stuff and study that independently, right? You may have to conduct your own studies and things like that, right? So a lot of sociologists, psychologists do this. They do this in nutrition and dietetics, that kind of thing. Uh, just because the, the field of study and the prerequisite things that you study, it's it's largely influenced by culture and consensus, right? Um, but even scientific studies, and I'm big on leaning on scientific studies, but a lot of the scientific studies that we currently have available, it's not, um, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect, but the gap is, so I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a study. Let's say you would say, okay, how much protein on average does a person need to consume in order to maximize muscle growth? Is it 1.2 grams per kilogram of lean mass or is it 1.6? We're going to take two groups. One is going to be in the 1.2. One is going to be in the 1.6, right? Here's the thing. Let's say, oh, the 1.6 has better results than the 1.2. Oh, okay, so 1.6 is best. Well, were they both eating the same amount of carbohydrates? Were they eating the same amount of fats? Because you can't have the same pro, you can't have the same diet plan and just one is 1.2 and one is 1.6. And the reason why is because in order to add more protein to the diet, you necessarily have to decrease either the carbohydrates or the fats, right? Now, were both groups raw vegans were they high raw vegans were they eating like a standard american diet what was the diet plan like because the rules fundamentally change if you're eating a plant-based diet and not an omnivorous diet oh well why is that it's because the more plant-based your diet is the easier it is to recover from training to even build muscle in the first place well why is that because a whole food plant-based diet is typically less in dietary fat than an omnivorous diet. It also has lower levels of saturated fat, which means that you're more likely to be more insulin sensitive on a, on a whole food plant-based diet than an omnivorous diet. And chances are your carbohydrates are going to be much more, much higher on a plant-based diet than an omnivorous diet. So there's all of these other little nuances that are not made up for in the study. Also, um, the what is the training age of everyone in the study? What are their origins and insertions of their muscle groups? So for example, are is everybody in the groups, are they genetically on par with each other? Do they have long muscle bellies, short muscle bellies? What are their genetics like? Are they genetically geared? Because I'm telling you right now, the people who have the most ability to gain the most amount of muscle mass are the ones with longer muscle bellies, right? Meaning that where their muscle attaches on the joint causes their muscle to be much longer. And if your muscle is longer, it also has the capability to be much wider and thicker. If a muscle is short, that limits its ability to be girthier, right? So then what happens is if one group, that one group just so happened to have muscle bellies that were much longer, therefore they gained muscle much more efficiently than the other group that had shorter muscle bellies. And if they didn't test for that and take those measurements before the study, that skews the results. Right? Then take medical history. What is their medical history? So there's all, and you can't account for all these things in one study. There's just way too many variables that you can't really account for in one study. So this is going to skew the numbers of, of the, of this study, right? So these are kind of things that you, you have to really factor in, um, when you look at studies It's not a reason to dismiss the data, but just know that the data isn't bulletproof.
because of all the other variables that weren't accounted for. Right? All right. What's the best way to detox from black coffee? <laughs> Just stop drinking it. <laughs> oh, let's see. All right. Could I stay around 240 pounds on a raw vegan diet? Also, will eating fish like sardines hurt the effects of a raw vegan? I wouldn't eat sardines. I wouldn't touch sardines. <laughs> there are there are much better things to eat than sardines. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat sardines. Um, can you so? Could you stay around 240 pounds on a raw vegan diet? Um. You could, hypothetically. It just depends on what your body composition is and what your lifestyle is like. But you could, yeah, theoretically you could. You can maintain, well, I wouldn't say any weight. Um, but yeah, technically you could. It just depends, 240 pounds of what. Yeah, muscle grows the way calluses do. Yeah, I guess you could say, yeah, actually, yeah, you grow like how calluses does. It's a defense mechanism. Um, so that's why when people ask me like, oh, I'm on a raw vegan diet, but I want to gain weight. And it's like, well, your ability to gain fat mass is going to be very limited on a raw vegan diet. If you want to get fat, a raw vegan diet is not going to be the way to go. It's just not going to happen. Um, but if you want to gain lean muscle mass, you're going to have to work for it. You have to, you have to really work for it, right? So you have to train hard, but you have to train very intelligently and you got to know when to rest so don't go to the gym and train if you feel exhausted don't do that take another day and rest if you need another one after that then you take another one you may need to take three or four days off from training before you hit your next training session that's fine recovery right recovery is the goal because the thing is you don't grow from the training you grow from from the recovery so you train, then recover, then after the recovery, you get the growth. This is how this happens. If you never recover, you never get the growth. Right? Is CoQ10 a good supplement? Um, you can actually, I mean, you can actually get this naturally, even with raw foods. You can take it as a supplement. I don't really think it's it's all that necessary. What's wrong with sardines? Uh, heavy metal contamination, um, plastic contamination. I mean, just a variety of different types of contamination. <laughs> I'll just say that. Oh, uh, so yeah, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't supplement with co with, with co CoQ10. I think eating more quercetin rich foods. I mean, apples, right? You get your quercetin that way, right? Um, cherries, you get your quercetin that way. Uh, what else? Grapes, you get your quercetin that way. All right, I think we covered it. Did we get to it? Did we get it? Did we get all to it, folks? I think we did. Folks, hit the like button on the stream. We got a little bit of a hitch today tonight, but that's all good. We got folks back in here in the stream. Folks went and jumped right back on. You know what I mean? Um, I want to start doing more, more. Um, I don't know if I should do more shorts on my YouTube videos or if I should do more long form videos where I record. I'm probably gonna have to record off stream, maybe. Um, I've just been very busy. Today was actually a um. Today was a was like a ten and a half hour work day for me. I started my first call today at eleven a.m. and I've been straight from eleven a.m. to now nine thirty tonight. It's not quite ten hours, not quite getting there. But yeah, so it's 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 been a long day for me, but I am obsessive. I'm very invested in what I do and getting getting out and getting this information out. 
You know what I'm saying? Um, and this is a form of activism for me. <laughs> right? So it's not just a job. I'm serious. Um, I've been vegan now 10 years. Right? Whole food, plant-based. And I had to challenge a lot of my pre-existing beliefs along the way about everything, carbs, fats, protein, training, how much sleep you need. I mean, everything, right? Um, and I had to unlearn and, and then learn new things. I had to go through a lot. Um, and I realized that throughout my life, especially when it comes to eating or training, I've been doing it wrong most of my life. So now, like, you know, I'm learning how to do things correctly because the way that I learned how to do things, and this is where I realized, like, you know, formal education is necessary, but it's not an end point. Right? Um, because, because the more you learn, the more you realize, and PhDs know this, right? The more you learn, the more you realize how much we haven't actually figured out. Right. Um, oh, by the way, you know, it's interesting. I keep thinking of new things to talk about. Have y'all heard of Ozempic? Have y'all heard of this? I'm in college for kinesiology, want to learn more about nutrition. Oh, um, yeah. What books would I suggest? Um, I think it's called The Dirty Dozen, How Not to Die, uh, Eat to Live. Uh, Dr. Michael Greger's put out, I, I like his stuff. Um, those are like the, the main ones that, that I can think of now. But most of what I read are more so scientific studies, just because I don't want to. If I pick up your book and it's like, and it starts with, when I was a child, I'm the, I, I can't. I don't want to hear about your stories with your dad fishing or whatever suburban things you did. I don't want to hear about that. I want to get into the meat and potatoes. What does the data say? That's what I want to know about. Um, I can't. I don't have the time. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm like, oh, no. You know, when I was a young boy, I'm like, no, 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 no stop. That's too, that's too much. I can't do it. That's what, like if people ask me, like, oh, you should write a book. It would be straight up meat and potatoes. You wouldn't know anything about me as a human being. It would just, here's what, here's the meat, here's the, th the facts, period. One, two, three, right? Um, but in any case, a lot of what I read is like the the, the current data. Like, what does the scientific data say? How was the how was the, the the studies conducted? All this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, kinesiology is good to learn. Um, and you learn a lot of that in corrective exercise too. You know, exercise, uh, physiology, all this kind of stuff. And that's how you learn about the muscle bellies thing, right? Origin and insertion, right? And that's how you measure, you know, what the growth capability uh, is of a muscle. So for example, a muscle will never be thicker than its length, right? So that's how you can determine um, the how how big a muscle can get judging by its judging by its uh, its length, right? This kind of thing. Um, what else? You know, for example, to one of the things, the most important lessons I've learned that in order to fix a joint injury or something, usually it's not about fixing the joint that's injured. It's about fixing other things around it. So it's always going to be a peripheral solution. So for example, tight hip flexors doesn't necessarily mean you got to stretch the hip flexors. It means you have to strengthen uh, the glutes first, right? Um, that kind of thing. So you can stretch your hip flexors all you want, but if your glutes are still weak, you'll never really fix your hip flexors, right? Um, a lot of times people have hit, you know, tight hip flexors. You can stretch all, you can stretch all you want. You can stretch every day, but if you're sitting in a chair for multiple hours, uninterrupted every single day, you're going to have tight hip flexors, no matter how much you stretch. Um, and if your glutes are weak, it's because you're sitting on your soft tissues all day. You're just wearing out your glutes, right? So this kind of thing. Um, doing, you know, corrective exercise, I realized that my tallest clients had the worst posture, right? And I'm like all the clients that were like six foot four, six foot five, right? They just, they're like the tallest person in the room. 
their, their back is like really rounded out, right? And they got like this kind of posture rounded out here. And I realize, well, they're like that because the world we live in is not geared towards people who are that tall. So when they're talking to a person, if you're six foot four and you're talking to somebody who's 5'10", you're not going to stand up in front of them and talk to them like this and just look down your nose at them, right? Because you're going to feel like an asshole for doing that. So you kind of hunch over a little bit to kind of look at them and bring yourself down to their level or whatever, right? And it's just like a natural impulse you have when, when you're the tallest person in the room, you know? Um, it's kind of like when you talk to a child, you know, you kind of kneel to talk down to the child, that kind of thing. And then when they're sitting at a desk, the desk is so much lower for them than it is for your average height person. So they have to hunch over at the desk more. And so they're just hunching over to everything all the time. So they just get stuck like that. Right? <clears throat> Life circumstances will like literally mold people in this kind of way. And so you can do all of this extra work to fix their posture, but then they go on the rest of their life still having these habits of hunching over all the time. So it undoes all the, it undoes all the progress that you made with them. You don't really learn that um, when studying corrective exercise. <laughs> I learned that um, from just experience. You just work with these people who are ridiculously tall. They all have this terrible posture. And you're like, well, why are they so super kyphotic all the time? And I'm like, oh, that's why. You have that light bulb moment. Like, oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> right? Um, and so then you have to have that conversation with them. Like, look, you're just going to have to be an asshole and just stand up straight when you talk to people, right? Stop hunching over to talk to people. And then get a desk that rises or whatever the case is. Do these little lifestyle adjustments. Right? Um, so, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So you just learn things on the way. It's kind of like you, you can study exercise. You can study uh, nutrition. But when it comes to writing diet plans then the actual practice of writing diet plans it's a skill that you develop over time and then you become like you have this internal log in your head of like all of the calories and macros and nutritional values of foods so you could just rattle off specific foods that are good for specific things and how much of this and that and all of that and that just comes with practice um no degree is really going to prepare you for that right it's good to get a degree but just understand that Continuing education is going to teach you way more than anything else will. Right? So this is where, like, experience is king. Right? Um, and that's one of the things that I learned personally. Because the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And then, it, and then when that feeling of not knowing sets in, it makes me study even more. <laughs> And it's this perpetual cycle. It's this vicious cycle. Like, oh, you learned a lot. Well, actually, you don't know as much as you think you do. Oh, I want, well, then I need to know more. And it repeats. Can you answer my question about Brazil nuts? Dangerous because of selenium. No, you're not going to get selenium poisoning from eating uh, Brazil nuts. Excess selenium is just gonna be is is just gonna be excreted in your fecal matter, so you wouldn't really have to worry about that. Now, if you were taking if you were supplementing with excessive levels of selenium, then you'd have a problem. But if you're getting it from natural foods, you're not gonna have to worry about that. How harmful are fruits that aren't grown organically? Um, I couldn't say how harmful they are. I don't know to what degree. I couldn't even put a number on that. Um, I don't really have any data to draw from. If I was to give you like a percentage or a number, I would just be making it up because I don't know for sure. I don't know how damaging or not they are actually. Um, I can speculate, right? Like all oh, the pesticides and they could potentially cause problems when they accumulate in your body, depending on the rate that they do accumulate. But I don't know to what degree that they accumulate. Nobody really does. Uh, cause it's just too many variab variables to really predict how to what level they're going to accumulate. So I just don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't think that it's anything to get paranoid about. 
if I couldn't afford like, you know, the organic strawberries, well, then I'm just going to get the conventionally grown strawberries. I'm not going to just avoid strawberries, right? Or grapes or whatever, right? It's like, oh, well, none of the watermelon have are like loaded with black seeds. So I'm just going to not eat watermelon. Like, I'm not doing that. I'll get, I'm not going to stop eating watermelon just simply because like, oh, it's so hard to find a watermelon with a sufficient amount of black seeds in it. I'm not going to do that. Um, so you get you get the organic whenever you can, but don't worry if you can't get it. That would be the answer that I would give there. Oh yeah, Ozempic. Yeah, I brought up Ozempic. Um, okay, and this is like another thing that I got to talk about. I got to do a live stream about this. Here's a very important rule. Nothing is free. Ozempic... Um, pretty much plays with your hormones to suppress your appetite. The damage that comes from the suppression of your appetite is basically destroying your gut and your hormones. Okay. Um, if you take any type of, of, of like appetite suppressant for long enough, essentially what happens is you get this permanent and, uh, appetite suppressant where you can't keep food down, so you, it can cause perpetual vomiting, or um, you can have the opposite effect. We start, you come off, you start binge eating and gaining back all the weight. And that can happen also. So some of the side effects is like, you know, the destruction of your gut lining, um, rapid weight gain when you come off the Ozempics and then you get back on it, and it's just a big mess. So people say, oh, you know, well, Ozempic is good for diabetics because it gets your, your blood sugar down. And it's like, eh, not really, right? Essentially what it does is an appetite suppressant. Nothing is free, right? If you want to drop, if you want to lose weight, the, the most effective way to lose weight is fasting, period. Fasting is not free either. But if you had the choice between fasting and taking Ozempic, the Ozempic is going to be is going to be much higher of a price. Everything you do in your life is a trade. And your goal and your responsibility to yourself is to make the best trade that you have available to you. And some of the best trades is not artificially manipulating your hormones. Never do that. If you keep pumping your body with a particular hormone, that will reduce your body's ability to secrete and produce that hormone. Right? Um, that's a cost that's way too high. Anything that yields you a lot of results on the front end, you usually have to pay a price on the back end. It's a very important thing to know, right? So this is why it's very important to not rush and try to get like, oh, I just want to do the thing that's going to get me the most results up front. It's not really a good idea. You have to know what the price is that you have to pay on the back end. It's like financing something. Let's say you're, you're going to finance an item. This thing costs $20,000 and you want to finance it. And, you know, you're financing it at, you know, 25, 30% interest. You can get the thing that you're financing up front. That's $20,000. But by the time you fully paid off the bill with all the interest and all of that type of stuff, you would have ended up paying $45,000 for it. That's the price you pay on the back end for the financing. Right? So if you slow walk the payments, just understand the more you slow walk it, the more of a back end price you have to pay. These are the kind of trades that I'm talking about, right? Um, so I figured I would just share that, you know, as the whole o Ozempic thing, because I heard a lot of nightmare stories about Ozempic and I looked into it. I'm like, oh, okay, well, yeah, there you go, right? So just another one of these medications that are, that are wrecking people big time, people who are trying to get a, a weight loss pill all right, no such thing as a weight loss pill. So it's on creatine. Uh, creatine is phenomenal for impro for improving training performance and creating an environment inside your muscle to maximize muscle protein synthesis. 
also creatine is also very good for mental health and um there is scientific data that shows that creatine um can also reduce um cognitive decline later on in in years when you get older right um so yeah a lot of good stuff out about creatine it's one of the few supplements that, that that's like actually like really legit thank you for that analogy yeah for sure all right y'all it's getting it's it's getting close to my bedtime here it's time to wrap up we did a lot tonight we had a good one on the stream tonight little little bit of a hiccup on the stream tonight so i'm very interested to see what that looks like for the replay <laughs> But it is what it is. Um, every Monday, every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, I'm on here. All right. So definitely hit the link in my bio to book a call with me. Uh, we had a full 60 minutes on a call. If you book a call, you pick whatever day and time you want. It's available on the calendar. And I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>